All right. Are you ready to dig I'm into ready this? Ready to engage. Okay. Yeah. So, am I going to be? Should I start loading stuff up? Joe, what were you doing in 2001? I was going to college. I had two jobs. I went to band practice at night. I went to Linda's after that. And I got up at early in the morning and did the same thing over and over. And we would demo in a rehearsal space and save our money to eventually make a record. How about you? Same, kind of, yeah. you know. I was uh, leaving a band. I was starting to create uh, a new project I was working on, and that was all being done in the bedroom. I had an apartment above one of the bars I was working at, but it was a lot of a lot of that. It was a lot of uh, demoing and uh, working. And James was doing the same thing, just in Albuquerque, not Seattle, like us. Yeah, except smarter. I feel like you know he found the equipment that really worked for him. He's a figure. You're figure outer. James Mercer is a figure outer. He reads books. Not that you don't read books, but I would try to record with a four track hours before I would pick up the manual. But that's just me. Oh, I never picked up the manual. Yeah. I don't think I had a four track with a manual. Yeah. Um, so it's just a lot of mistakes. Anyways, James figured it out. He did figure it out. Okay. So for anyone who didn't read the title, of the episode. Today we are talking to James Mercer about a song that he wrote around 2001 called New Slang. Near the 20th anniversary of O Inverted World. Unbelievable. I was in the same orbit as the Shins, so I feel a little subjective about the popularity of O Inverted World, but I quickly became objective watching new slang become a massive song and outside of the reach that the garden state movie may have had on that song i just simply think it's a fantastic song yeah i i agree i love it start to finish and i think one of the coolest things uh was talking about who produced and mixed it i was pretty surprised at what he said but yeah i mean it was just one of those songs where the the, the moment you heard it it was hard to think of anyone who wouldn't like it. There is a lyric in that song, bleed into your buns. <laughs> Every time I would play that song live, I would laugh. I, it gave me a feeling every time, obviously. I just having James's vocals piped into my ears while I'm trying to keep it cool and new slang. And then I hear bleed into your buns. I didn't know what that meant for a really long time. Well, I can imagine. I um, didn't, and, and I, I was almost like, I don't know if it's, <laughs> how do I ask about this beautiful lyric? Well, uh, he told us. <laughs> he does. Uh, thankfully. Well, you and I are both familiar with the demo to sort of final song process. We've done it together. Of course, we've done it separately over the years. For me, it's it's aggravating. It's wonderful. It's eye-opening. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think it's a waste of time and everyone has their opinion, that's part of what demo-itis is. Yeah, it can be hard. You know, it's, I think it's a trope at this point, but that's how a lot of bands break up. Well, it's exciting to hear how James went from kernel to final product, and the shins did not break up. In fact, they did the opposite. Yeah, this is a good one. I'm excited about this one. Me too. I'm Dan Gallucci. I'm Joe Plummer. And this is Demoitis, James Mercer with New Slang. This would be, this is going to be the very first time I came up with the idea for the verse for the main part right and right. so i just came up with it and then just recorded it for a second i did two versions of it and then it was done and the funny thing is is that when when a song works right off the bat 
I just mm-hmm. generally record it once or twice, and then I never go back to it again on the tapes. I, you know, because right. I, I spent a couple hours just going through these old tapes, and what I noticed was that the ones that end up on the record, I don't sweat over. It's weird. Yeah, right. Like, I mean, the thing, the tapes are filled with stuff that's just mediocre. You know, just things, and and I'm, you can hear me trying to fucking make it cool, like somehow, and then, and then I added this, now I'll record it again with that thing, you know, and it's just trying to polish a turd. You know? how, how how long will you work on something before it's just like either, I mean, if you know it's good, you're gonna move on, but like before right. you just ditch it, or do you ever ditch songs? Um, I do ditch them because like the these are MC60 tapes, and there's probably. 30 of them. Oh my God. So yeah. that's a lot. That's a lot of just sweating over stuff that didn't work. Yeah. You know, especially cause uh, if the, if a lot of them are in like short increments and stuff like yeah. that, it's like, but the yeah, ones that suck, ton. the ones that suck are the long increments. It goes on Sorry. and on and on. <laughs> yeah, and I'm forwarding <laughs> through it, listening, you know, God, so, and listening back to that must be like, Oh, there's, this is a long, this is long. It's humbling. Is, there's going to be something good in here. And then you listen to it, you're like, yeah. what the fuck was that? It's funny. And then <laughs> there'll be periods where it's, it's solid idea after solid idea. And I don't, it's not like in those moments you feel all filled with inspiration or anything. It's just for <laughs> some reason you are more concise about them for a little while. I've learned how to do this now. Like I use, I, I use my iPhone now you know, instead mm-hmm. of this tape recorder that we'll hear. Um, just get the idea down, mention maybe the chords, you right. know, don't don't leave yourself hanging so that six months later when you listen back, you're like then having to try and figure out the chords. Yeah. Mention the chords, do it really quick, get the basic idea down and then boom, done. Don't Walk do it away. eight times, you know, mm. because you want to be able to rifle through the ideas and you just make it more inf- efficient. So when... When these demos were recorded, were you in Albuquerque? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. This was me living in a little studio apartment in Albuquerque, working at a ceramics factory that made Southwestern-style sconces and pendant oh. lights and stuff like that. That's so, awesome. so you were working 9 to 5, living in an apartment? N- not 9 to 5. Mm-hmm. I had... <laughs> This is so I had supplemented my income by growing marijuana <laughs> in my closet. Mm. So I had that and I had my part time job over right. here. And then I was able to start recording and had more time to myself. I'm sure a lot of people that would listen to this know this, but for those who don't, you were in a, a, the project. Was, was is it the right way to say that the project was originally called Flake Music, or that was mm. just a completely different band? It, it really was a completely different band. It was, okay. it was, but it was my best friends. So, you know, the way that we would write songs there is we'd get a case of beer and we'd go in the basement and just start riffing and jamming, and something would be cool, so we'd start messing with that. It, it was just a real band. And would this have been a song for that band or was this just something for something new? This, this was a song that was introduced to the band, but it didn't make the cut because it wasn't, we were kind of like a power pop sort of vibe, you know, and it just didn't take when I sort of showed it. It was like, what are we going to do with that? We're going to have a little acoustic moment in the middle of the set. It just didn't make sense. And so that, that frustration that I started to feel because I was starting to get into some of these acoustic songs. And, uh, I I was fascinated by older music. I was listening to the oldie station all the time and, um, was rebelling against the sort of whatever that punk thing was that was taking over in the indie world. You know, I was just starting to kind of rebel against it. I Mm. had this, I was missing those sort of, chills that you get when you hear a certain song that's earnest Mm -hmm. and really effective and like i was like maybe that could be a thing you know maybe if i work at it i could get some of that and so i was i was going that direction and so that frustration with being introducing some of these ideas and then having them shut down led to the shins and the shins was just a recording project then it was just me in the bedroom and the first live inception of of the shins was me and the drummer we were just a two-piece for a while jesse 
Or a different drummer. Jesse. Jesse, my best friend, you know? Yeah, okay. So when you wrote New Slang, were you in an in-between period and maybe wanted to go in a different direction from Flake Music, or were you just writing songs? Yeah, I was, I was writing songs constantly, mm -hmm. um, and I was shifting over to this idea that I can write songs for recording, not, f not for playing live. Just I had, I had this little HP Pavilion computer, Mm -hmm. And a buddy of mine gave me a black market copy of Cool Edit Pro where you could oh, multi-track, yes. you know, and and then I spent the money to buy a, a, a two a two channel converter called the gold card. And it, <laughs> it was it, it was it was a device that was being marketed to broadcast radio people. Mm -hmm. um, so I had that thing. So everything I recorded could only be two tracks. Right. You know, two tracks at a time. So that's O Inverted World is this really sort of juggling of tracks and where do I put them and you have to mix them down and all that stuff. For O Inverted World, did you just take the demos and enhance them or not demos, but the mm. previous recordings and enhance them or did you re-record anything? I really didn't. The only song I re-recorded was New Slang. And that was because Jonathan Poneman at Sub Pop, he just felt like he loved the song and he was like, I, I think it could have more clarity and be a little bit stronger. And I understood what he was saying. And so, because I had been using an SM57 as the vocal mic yeah, on everything. And so I was, I had read that there are microphones that have a large diaphragm that are more for vocals, you know? Yeah. I mean, this is Albuquerque, and I didn't know anybody who was a recording engineer oh, yeah. or anything like that. So I had read about this, and Rode had come out. They were a new company, mm -hmm. and for 300 bucks, they had the NT1. Mm -hmm. that, so I could afford that. That was mm -hmm. like two bags a week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I could sell that and, and buy a Rode NT1. And I got that, and it was like night and day. The other thing about it was it was a balanced I mean, just the fact that it was, it could go through my balanced inputs on the Mackie mixer I had made it so quiet. It was very quiet. Yeah. So less oh, hiss yeah. and everything. So I got that. And, and then I was like, okay, I can redo new slang and it'll have a, a different vibe. It'll, it'll help maybe hopefully. I remember being at a party in a house in Portland in like a basement murder city devils or something had just played and then we saw you guys and somehow had met you before or just meeting or something like that mm -hmm. but someone gave me a tape of a lot of the songs at least that were on O inverted world oh cool it was like the only thing i listened to for a couple months but it was so cool just to hear so, yeah i I, just, I think i just appreciated like the craft and oh, i cool. love the songs but like just to hear it I mean, in my memory, it was, it was fairly different than the stuff that was really going around, I, yeah. Yeah. you know, and I always, I feel like I get in trouble saying this, but it's really a compliment pavement who I love, but they were so big, the yeah. impact that they had, I mean, aesthetically on the scene was so big and flake was guilty of ripping off pavement, you know? And, and just kind of trying to emulate some of that crazy tongue in cheek vibe that they, right. that they did. And of course there's Arches of Loaf and countless other bands. And so I was trying to do something different instead of tongue in cheek. I wanted to be a little bit earnest and I was kind of like yearning for things like Echo and the Bunny Men, where it was right. drama kind of would happen and it'd be yeah. legit yeah. drama. They weren't faking it, you know? Yeah. When... When I first heard The Shins, and probably the same thing for Dan, we were on tour with you as Modest Mouse, Blackheart, and The Shins. And then we had the same tape in the Blackheart mm -hmm. car on tour, mm -hmm. and we were listening to it. And the one thing that I think The Shins have a massive influence over is classic songwriting. Like, it's okay. You don't have to be mm -hmm. weird. And it's like, it's okay to actually write a good song. Right. <laughs> and, and so many words. You know, I just think that... It's classic songwriting in a way, but it's more thoughtful, and it kind of allowed everyone to do that once everyone heard new slang on ah, the radio. That's interesting. I'm, I I remember not feeling confident about that, you know, really being like, I don't know, it's pretty straight sounding, you know. Yeah, but, but it never really is. 
playing music with you, it never is very straight. You always throw something weird in there. <laughs> <laughs> but it does I, sound cla it's classic, and it's like it just made it okay for everyone to do that. I think. Yeah, I mean, I think it. There wasn't a lot of stuff that sounded like this at this time, and it mm. really like there are a few things that I feel like really changed kind of the trajectory of what would come after it and i think that this album was a huge one for that you know what gave me some um fortitude in this idea of doing this was bell and sebastian because we all yeah. loved that record with fox in the snow on it and all that if you're feeling sinister and that so when that happened and their production it was so stripped down it wasn't like a massive distorted guitar and it wasn't mm -hmm. shoegazy. It wasn't, you know, it was just simple songs. Do you remember what you were listening to right, mm. right around then? Was the it time? Echo and the Bunny Men or? Like I said, oldies stuff. Oh, okay. Um, while going through the tapes that led up to this, I would spend a lot of time with sort of dissonant chords. And I think I still had this shoegazy sort of, thing that I thought somehow I could make cool that just wasn't me I guess and then this song pops out all right and um, yeah and it sounds like this So, yeah, I don't know the what that part is that like the beginning of the chorus kind of at the end there. I don't know. And I remember that part existing. I didn't know that I had it attached to this, to the new slang. So what did you think when you recorded that and played that back for the first time? I liked it a lot. I liked it a lot. I was proud of it. I remember showing my girlfriend at the time and playing it a lot and just trying to figure it out what could it lead into what you know just um i knew there was something good there just in that and that you know don't screw it up <laughs> you know gold teeth and the curse for this town are all in my mouth only i don't know how they got out Was that the first song that you wrote for O oh, Inverted World? No, um, there were earlier things. So, yeah, there, there were earlier songs that were more in the vein because that was unusual for me. I mean, I was really trying to write songs that were a little bit rock and roll and that might um, just bridge the gap between the live stuff and the recorded stuff, you know, something that could work on stage at least. And so I wouldn't have imagined this ever really be being performed on stage. It's so interesting, too, because the basic is your guitar and your voice. So it mm. seems like something that will yeah. work, you know, immediately on stage. I, yeah. But the acoustic thing, I didn't know how, how could I do that with an electric guitar? And I just, right. I wasn't that sophisticated. <laughs> I wasn't sure how to do it. Do you remember how long it took you to come up with the, the melody? Well, that is like 98 or 99 or early mm -hmm. 99. So it took a while. That thing floated around quite a bit. And I remember I, I for a long time, I played it as um, dun, 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 dun. Mm -hmm. I would do that with the guitar. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and I don't know why. Did you have like yeah, those are <laughs> in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> and so I don't know why, but I gave up on that and it, it kind of went back to how it was started really when you write a song normally do you start with music or more or do you kind of yeah that's me band? scatting that's just yeah that, I mean, vocal bullshit 
Yeah. So you normally, do you normally start with a chord progression or do you hear a melody in your head or? Uh, it's kind of both at the same time. I'm looking for uh, putting chords together, just trying them out and then immediately try and come up with a cool melody that would work, you know? So it's just, it's just that yeah. building on stuff very slowly. So the second uh, micro cassette tape, yeah. that, is that getting into the chorus? I don't know. I can't remember what's on okay, this Let's one. listen to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Back into the frog I was when we met. You know, the wrong idea. But, you know, I had different ideas I was exploring for a second for a B park. Yeah. But you knew, it seems like you knew you were going to have something, whether it was the whistle or it ended up being a kind of a guitar that yeah. was going to carry part of the, or melodically mm -hmm. take a lead that, that's based on the vocal kind of. Yeah, I, I do remember standing in the kitchen with Jesse and playing the song for him and singing the intro part right but i don't remember mm -hmm. coming up with it I, I can't recall that and i didn't hear it on this so it came much later did jesse sing with you no he wasn't a singer per okay se, yeah but he liked it a lot you know he was great to have as a muse yeah because he'd be very open you know he wouldn't be like no oh, it's pretty right. good whatever dude <laughs> you know, he was very, it's a bad he, news. Yeah. you know, he'd, he'd be like, dude, that's awesome. That's a cool part. Let's record that, you know. This version that we're about to listen to is the one, um, I'm forgetting the name. Is this the one that came out as the B-side as well recent or more recently? Yeah. yeah when you notice the, the stripes. Version, right, that came out. Yeah, right. It was originally called When You Notice the Stripes. Awesome. Well, let's hear it. I'm excited. So this is all cool at a pro. Go to find a curse of this town. We're all in my mouth, only I don't know how they got out, dear. Turn me back into the past. I was when we met. I was happier then with no mindset. And if you took to me like a girl takes to the wind, well, I'd have jumped. From my trees and I to dance like a king in the ice And the rest of our lives would have fed well Near slang when you notice the stripes The dirt in your grinds My dad prefers this version Your dad does? Yeah, he likes the demo version does he get into it and talk to you about all your songs and stuff? Especially back then. You know, I think yeah. now it's kind of old hat. Like, are oh, you doing another? He's lost track of all the stuff I'm doing. But um, back then it was a kind of a big deal because it was, you know, in Flake, we're doing this loud punk pop stuff. And, you know, they were just like, oh, you, you know, are you meeting people? <laughs> then it's great. You having fun? You getting laid? <laughs> All right, kid. Uh, but then when I started showing them, you know, something like new slang is pretty accessible. So they started taking more interest. 
And I had had a conversation with them. I, you know, I knew I needed, I knew what I was doing wasn't sustainable. I needed to get a proper job. I needed, I had higher hopes than just working at a factory and selling weed on the side. Right. You know? So I told them like, I'll try and do some really solid recording work and see if I get anywhere with it. And if I don't in a year, I'll go back to school. You know, that was my commitment. So what's the big differences on that? versus the studio version right well i mean the studio version is just that the i re-recorded everything you did just trying to do it tighter you know and then it was just the the purchase of that road nt1 gave me that fidelity on the vocal mm -hmm. that stands out and it's a pretty big difference mm -hmm. and then my the phrasing of the the melody is just kind of a little bit cooler i think on the second version but there's this, th that first, oh, the other thing is I used a metronome on the second version. That you one did. like slows down as it goes. Yeah, oh. I know, I know right where it slows down. and It, it does, yeah. It And it makes me. That's what my dad misses. It, I kind of miss it too. And I imagine yeah. it on the studio version. It's a very weird We phenomenon. had a long conversation about it. You know, he was like, scientifically, the new version is better. If you know, just mathematically, <laughs> it's supposed to be, it's better, but artistically, the first one is superior, you know? And so it's like, what are you selling? You selling art or science? <laughs> so that was his argument. Your dad was a musician, right? Yeah. Yeah, he was. And, you know, and a big music fan, big yeah. Beatles fan and just loved music. Um, can we talk about the bass line? Yeah. That's what, Dave, so it's Dave Hernandez. Oh, that. that's Hernandez. Okay. Yeah, okay. he came up with that whole bass line, which I, really I, makes it. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's great. It's a yeah. great bass line. Dude, like, he's the, fantastic. Dave Hernandez is. is, yeah, underused. How involved was he? Did he just kind of come by and play a bass part, or was he uh, someone that you could kind of work with or, mm -hmm. or work off of back and forth? Oh, well, yeah, he's open to discussion about everything yeah. um so you know i only had two inputs on my hp pavilion right and then the other device i had was a roland um vs 880 or something 840 it was a, like a six track digital recorder oh, that yeah. used zip drives mm -hmm. so i had that thing and that's how i recorded the drums because i could get six tracks right and get right. you know pretty good drum deal going Although the drums sound so freaking terrible on that record. It's unbelievable. I, I mean, for kind of shame. Like <laughs> it's fine. It works. It, it, it's happened. But, um, but anyway, that's what I would do. I'd bring that thing up to uh, my old place that had a basement. I'd record uh -huh. Jesse and get his drums on there. And, um, and I lived in this little studio apartment where I couldn't be loud. I couldn't right. do anything loud. And... I didn't know anything about going DI with the bass. So in my mind, we, I need to take my machine and bring it up to the old house and Dave can sit there and I asked right. him to write a bass line because I knew he would do something cool. So that's how we did it. I brought it up, we mic'd up an amp and he came up with that whole thing. And it's funny because, you know, it didn't have a bass line, but it was still a neat song and I was really stoked on it. And then the bass line came in and I really had to get used to it. You know what I mean? Oh, it wasn't right. like you I was like, me. oh, you just made the song so much better. I was like, oh, is I'm ready for this. What is this? <laughs> well, and it's now a part. it totally yeah. makes the song. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a part. It's it a big, important a part complimentary of it, part to it. But I could see how that would be like, whoa, this is a lot to think about. Yeah, yeah, because it adds a lot. Yeah. He has, I, I like, I, one of the things I really like about it is he's of course a guitar player a, a, as well. And so mm -hmm. it sounds, there are certain things that sound like the, the classic kind of guitar player playing bass, just yeah. like the willingness to get mm -hmm. high and mess around a little bit. And, and like, melodic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. That, so Jesse, what, did mm -hmm. he have the original kind of boom, boom, boom? That's just boom, me boom. in my bedroom. There's no kick drum. I think it was, uh, Honestly, I think it was, it was either the kick sound on my Casio, like purchased at Best Buy cheesy yeah. keyboard thing, um, maybe supplemented with like a cardboard box to right. just make it sound a little different. It was simple stuff like that. 
and then a tambourine hit that I just recorded. Yeah. And you're doing, you're figuring all this stuff out. Really figuring it out. And really, I bought a book that was written by a guy who had been engineering for Peter Gabriel. I want this book. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. It was home recording. It was basically yeah. how you can do the professional shit that we do, but do it at home. So I could kind of like, you know, there was a little section on EQ and what you should do to the kick drum. And, you know, here's the standard thing we do to the vocal. And so that helped a bit. And Cool Edit Pro had all of that, all of those options. The one thing was, is they weren't real time. You would have to make the change and then render it across right. the whole file right. and right. then listen back. And that rendering would take five minutes. Totally. Yeah. So you'd yeah. add an EQ to the vocal and then you'd sit and listen and decide then if you want to keep it or not. What happened with Sub Pop? You said that Jonathan or some Stuart had come down, right? Yeah, Stuart to and Sean. How did they hear you? I know that Zeke Howard from Love yeah. is Laughter had given them our music, mm -hmm. I, I, like a cassette tape or something. Right. Um, because they had been asking, like, you know, if you hear any cool stuff out on tour, let us know. You know, right. Sub Pop was looking for bands to sign. And then Isaac did the same thing. Mm -hmm. Isaac, who we had opened up for Modest Mouse. And so he came in with something similar and said, listen to this, it's cool, you know? So that was the, their first moment of hearing about us. And then Stuart told me he went to his computer and went on Napster and looked us up. And there were like 30,000 different servers that had the shins on it. And so he was like, oh, the kids like this. They're spreading it, it's spreading. Right. And so Napster kind of helped us get signed. That was mm. when they were like, okay, this, is, this is, has legs. I mean, when, when Sean and Stuart came to Albuquerque, it was big news that representatives of Sub Pop were going to be there in town, you know? Yeah. I mean, it was big. Um, people were dressing up better and going <laughs> out, you know? It's like... Did you go was... out to the proverbial meal? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they talk to you and they decide they're going to sign you and you're going forward Jonathan's originally just just for the the subscription service the right. record of the month or whatever yeah and then some pop singles that's what it was called were they was that just because they yeah it seemed like they knew they wanted to put out a record pretty immediately uh, they played it pretty close to their chest if they if they were wanting to sign us for multiple records or something they didn't let on it was just we'll try it out we'll do this single of the month club thing and and check that out then the idea was we would have a contract written up and do a record with them and then the contract showed up and it was for two records instead mm -hmm. of just one or would it have been three it would have been three so when, where did you go to record the, the new slang we all know? Where that was you? all recorded um, in my little studio on Broadway in, in Albuquerque, okay. except for the bass line, which I went up to capture that with Dave okay. Hernandez up at the old house. So you're still in Albu is it, it's all in Albuquerque mm -hmm. and you're recording this. Did in you mix bedroom. it yourself? Yeah, and mixed it myself. Yeah. That's amazing. I, I, I never There was no other option. That. You know, right. It would just, right. It had to be done that way. Should we listen to to part of that? Yeah, I got. I've got new slang right here. You awesome. Ready?
there's a lot of there's a lot of punching in to do On that. The guitar solo? So, yeah. Oh really? I, I'm not a yeah, I'm not a guitarist like that. So it's a lot of punching in. It doesn't feel like it. That's no. yeah. so fun. It really doesn't feel like it. It feels like you just played it and it just came out like cool. that. What were you playing? That was a um Silvertone Jupiter. The thing about the Silvertone is it's a short scale. Right. And so when I would dig in on stage, which I would do a lot because just nervous, being nervous, you know, and, yeah. and we're playing some upbeat stuff, you hit it hard and it flattens out. You know, right. it, it caves a little bit because right. it's shorter scale. And um, that started bugging me. And I was like, I should have a proper guitar. So I'll get a telly or something, you know. Yeah. And they don't do that. Um, <laughs> but those pickups are so different. I could never get the appropriate sound. I could never get that power out of my super reverb that I was getting with the Jupiter. And I was so frustrated. I was like, who, what, what's wrong? And no, you know, I could in Albuquerque, once again, you couldn't find anybody who knew who could tell me, you know, so I just stuck <laughs> with the Jupiter. That's what's so cool about, um, uh, older guitars. I mean, I think it's, and I'm luckily, I really love the aesthetics of those older guitars. Yeah. So it doesn't bother me at all that I can't go to Guitar Center. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, if you had to choose between the earlier version, you were talking about how your dad had made his choice and let yeah. you know. And yeah. we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but is it definitive for you one way or the other, the demo or the album track? I think I'm most proud of the, the album track. It just, it, I, I think it does sound better enough to my ear that I'm, I'm happy with it. I'd probably, that's, that'd be the one I'd show you. If I was right. introducing it to the song. Yeah. Do you have a favorite part of this particular song that, that exists in both versions? Huh? Um, I also like that solo and I like the intro. I mean, yeah. the intro I think is what sold the song. Mm -hmm. Whenever that came up, I, like I said, I don't remember that moment of inception for that, but it's cool. It's like kind of, spaghetti western vibe to it mm -hmm. especially know, with the guitar very lonely that, yeah in the way that you're strumming the guitar kind of has that feeling too to me it changes a lot from spaghetti western after that until yeah. you get to the solo which also kind of sounds a little bit like yeah. that um can i ask you about the lyrics i don't know if you're someone who likes talking about their lyrics or does mm. not like talking about their lyrics and i I'm respect good. both so I have to look them up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember what you were like, just what you could have um, been writing about or what you were kind of where you were at? What is new slang referring to? I mean, I think just um, having a re realization that's so profound or powerful that you can't even like shit doesn't even work or fuck. <laughs> you have to invent right. new <laughs> slang to really express. <laughs> that's that was what the idea was. Yeah, it's Shots just bombed. about my life at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Godspeed all the bakers at dawn. May they all cut their thumbs and bleed into their buns till they melt away. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, you know what, I know what that is from. I have, so at that time, my real idol was this woman, Amy Linton, who started Henry's Dress was a band that she did that were really popular in San Francisco, like an avant-garde pop band, but she was from Albuquerque. Yeah. So she had done it. She oh, had extracted yeah. herself from the scene that we were in and was now living in uh, a big city that was, you know, and we would go visit her and it was so amazing. Um, but she worked as a baker when she lived in Albuquerque. So that's kind of what I'm saying. That's where it got into my head because she would have to wake up at four in the morning to go and make, make the donuts, make the bread. There was a lot of angst about being 
in my late twenties and just not having anything figured out anything. Yeah. I hated my job. I was in an unhappy relationship. Um, you know, and I, I, strangely, I wasn't really depressed, you know, cause I've been depressed in my life, but I wasn't then. I just, I was just unhappy with so many things that I wanted to change about my life. So, you know, there's a certain sadness to it. Um, were you thinking at that point in your life that music could be your job? No, 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 no. No, you yeah. were just enjoying playing it and... Yeah, just, it was something I couldn't stop doing, sitting down with the guitar and and try, trying to write songs, because there would be moments that were a thrill, you know? Once in mm -hmm. a while, there'd be this, oh, this is a cool fucking thing, you know? And that just keeps you driving. Thank you, James, and thank you, Sub Pop Records. Demoitis is a co-production of Ruinous Media and Little Everywhere. For more info, go to demoitispodcast.com. And check back soon for the next episode of Demoitis with Dan Gallucci and me, Joe Plummer.